Welcome back friends. Uh, in this video we will be talking about the electron transport system and the generation of energy inside the cell. Now we all know that cell need energy and we all need energy except for energy we cannot stand, we cannot live, we cannot do a single thing. So in all the type of metabolic processes whatever we are carrying out if there are uh, the and the catabolic processes that means the breakdown of uh, the complex products like proteins fats and carbohydrates we must yield small molecules smaller molecules like fatty acids uh, normal simple sugars and uh, amino acids now finally all the metabolic processes that are being carried out with these small molecular uh, arrangements we finally yield the energy and that is our actual goal now there are several different ways of producing uh, those uh, simple uh, small fag fragments by different uh, bi biochemical pathways but the production of energy lies on the very important pathway wh wh what we are going to talk about which is the electron transport system but if I uh, start by taking a simple example and telling you a simple example for uh, for example say we are having the carbohydrates now the carbohydrates are there we are going to the glucose metabolism uh, right after the metabolism say we are going through the glycolysis now right after glycolysis we produced few amount of ATP and say what we have produced let me change the color we produce few amount of ATP usually two ATP molecules are being produced right so two ATP molecules are produced and few NADPH molecules or NADH molecules are also produced in this case okay so we produce these things now right after this glycolysis we also produce this pyruvate now we'll take this pyruvate and we convert this pyruvate into uh, something else into carbon dioxide and water uh, via via another cycle which is called a TCA cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle or citric acid cycle okay so right after the citric acid cycle we have produced this and including this what we have produced we have also produced uh, we have also produced GTP and which is uh, energetically equivalent to ATP in this case but it is having some different features than ATP too now it also produces NADH which is uh, another molecule uh, another electron carrying molecule and FADH2 which is another type of electron carrying molecule so right after all these stages right after the stages of glycolysis and Krebs cycle what we have produced we have produced uh, several type uh, several amount of NADH uh, uh, if I'm not wrong 10 NADH molecules uh, 2 GTP uh, not uh, yeah 2 GTP molecules and 2 ATP molecules are produced and uh, 2 FADH2 molecules are also produced uh, but uh, what is missing here if, if we think that our cell uh, the energy currency inside our body and this is ATP because without the energy currency you cannot buy anything in, in, in a, without uh, the money which is currency you cannot buy anything like the same way without the energy currency you cannot do a single job so whatever we are producing the energy rich molecule like NADA, GTP, uh, in, in a, in a FADH2 whatever we are producing but if we are not able to produce ATP all of our and uh, all of our works will be in vain and we cannot do a single job for uh, for for this purpose we must convert this energy rich molecule into ATP but it cannot be possible except for this electron transport system there there why the, the importance of electron transport system lies the electron transport system is basically based on some series of electron carrying molecules uh, which are called different complexes usually four different types of complexes are there uh, uh, four complexes through which the electrons uh, will be carried out from one to another and as a result protons will be pumped outside now this system is embedded in the mitochondrial membrane and, and inside the mitochondrial membrane a proton gradient is formed and with the help of this down uh, down concentration gradient of proton we can produce energy of ATP now this energy containing molecule like say NADH, FADH2 they can give this, their electrons to these complexes and can help to produce produce ATP now so uh, right after glycolysis and Krebs cycle which are a tedious job of producing all these things we have produced this energy rich molecules we are not directly producing energy currency which is ATP but now it's time for converting this energy rich molecule into ATP and that can be done only with the help of this electron transport system okay that's why the electron transport system is very very important to obtain inside the cell 
okay now in the following slides we'll be seeing some animations and most of them are animations and we'll see the overview of this electron transport system process and then we'll look at the each of the steps in in advanced detail and we'll find how this process is actually established and finally how the ATP is actually produced okay so be with me and let us see what we can do okay okay fine during glycolysis and the tricarboxylic acid cycle, oxidation of organic molecules results in production of reduced coenzymes such as NAD. These coenzymes transfer hydrogens to the electron transport chain, which is located in the bacterial cell membrane. A hydrogen consists of a proton and an electron. The electron transport chain consists of a series of special electron carrier proteins that shuttle electrons from NADH to a terminal electron acceptor such as oxygen. Electrons enter the electron transport chain when NADH transfers its protons plus electrons to a membrane embedded carrier protein. The electrons are sequentially carried along the electron transport chain while the protons are shuttled to the outside of the membrane. Some of the electron carriers, such as coenzyme Q, accept a proton from the inside of the cell membrane as it accepts electrons. The proton is then transported through the membrane as electrons move down the chain. This increases the proton gradient across the membrane and enhances the proton motive force. During aerobic respiration, the last carrier protein transfers a pair of electrons to oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain and water is formed. The enzyme ATP synthase utilizes the energy of the proton motive force to synthesize ATP. This enzyme allows protons to pass back into the cell and couples the energy released in this process to the phosphorylation of ADP to form ATP. Okay guys, now we have seen a basic overview which is a very good animation of giving you the overview or how is this process is, is actually happening. But uh, if you need to know uh, the in this, this mm, pathway in advanced detail then you must move on to the next slide. So let us move on to the next slide. Anyways, uh, what is happening actually I don't know. It's not moving on to the next slide. Hello. Okay. Okay, let me pause here. Okay guys, uh, now I'll be looking at uh, the different experiments that proves that this electron transport system is actually working uh, inside the mitochondrial cell and how it's actually working. Okay, so let us move on and see this. In 1961, Peter Mitchell proposed a mechanism called the chemiosmotic mechanism to describe how the mitochondrion fuels ATP production. He proposed that a gradient of protons forms across the inner mitochondrial membrane and that the movement of protons down this gradient into the matrix provides the energy to produce ATP. What experiment supported this hypothesis? In one experiment, the investigators manipulated the pH of the compartments on either side of the inner mitochondrial membrane. In this example, which side of the membrane would represent pH 7? and which would represent pH 8. Drag the answers to the appropriate boxes. Now this is a question for you guys too. Now you can know this is a very very basic part that uh, if you have a pH 7 that means we are having a lot of protons that means an acidic pH so this will be pH 7 and less protons means this is a basic that means pH 8. Okay so let's move on. The investigators began by immersing isolated mitochondria in a medium at pH 8. All compartments eventually equilibrate to pH 8, including the matrix and the intermembrane space. These mitochondria were starved of a food source, so they were unable to create their own proton gradient using the electron transport chain. The mitochondria were then moved to an acidic medium with a much higher concentration of protons. 
the outer membrane is freely permeable to protons, which allows protons to move quickly into the inner membrane space, lowering the pH of this compartment. These conditions quickly set up a proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Which arrow describes the direction that protons will have a tendency to flow across the inner membrane? Click on the correct arrow. Now, well, as you can see that uh, this is the part or intermembrane space which is full of protons present there and in, in this is the matrix region which is having a less amount of proton. Now, and we all know that uh, in the diffusion, uh, diffusion mechanism that it is always the tendency of the molecules to move from higher concentration gradients to low concentration gradient. Uh, this is the normal way. So, this will be the right arrow. Okay, so let's move on. Protons tend to flow from high concentration to low concentration. However, they only flow through specialized channels in the inner mitochondrial membrane. With the formation of this artificial proton gradient, the mitochondria formed ATP. Which of these scenarios would result in the formation of ATP by a mitochondrion? Click on the mitochondrion in the correct scenario. Now, uh, which uh, will be the correct scenario for this example? Now, you can see here, now, if this is uh, the correct situation, uh, now you can see uh, if, if there is uh, no proton inside the matrix, there will be a chances of uh, these protons to get inside the matrix. But if, if there is an equal distribution of protons inside the cell and outside the cell, inside the matrix, in the intermembrane space, in the outside the cell, they will be totally devastating and the cell will die eventually. So, this will be the right uh, phenomenon. Okay, so let's move on. What is the role of the proton channel, ATP synthase, in the production of ATP? To answer this question, investigators created artificial vesicles to mimic mitochondria. To these vesicles, they added a light-driven proton pump called bacteriorhodopsin from bacteria. When illuminated, the pH of the external solution increased, meaning that protons were pumped into the vesicles. The proton concentration became higher inside the vesicles than outside, creating a proton gradient. If ATP synthase from the mitochondria of cow cells is also incorporated into the vesicles, the vesicles formed ATP. Which of these scenarios would you predict to result in the formation of ATP? Click on the correct answer. There may be more than one correct choice. Well, now let us see different phenomena. In the first phenomena, that means uh, here we can see the same amount of proton in, in inside this this vesicle and outside the vesicle. So that means there will be no density gradient formation, and uh, if uh, there will be at all density uh, gradient formation, it cannot be possible. So this is not true. In the second uh, picture, we are having a less amount of proton inside the matrix and higher amount of protons inside outside the cell. So that means it will trigger uh, this cell to take up uh, these protons from outside to inside, but there will be no force to move these protons uh, from inside to outside. So this will not possible. But in the third scenario, what we are having, we are having higher concentration of proton inside this uh, vesicle and low concentration of proton outside the vesicle. That can tell us, yes, now uh, down the concentration gradient, these protons can flow from the inside to the outside through this uh, ATP synthase and they can generate energy. So this will be correct. So this is a correct answer. And the second thing is uh, about this is, uh, this is, uh, these are the, Rhodopsins, so they can they can trigger by they can be triggered by light, and as a result of that, uh, they can eventually pump these protons inside the cell. And as they pump this proton inside the cell, uh, there is having this uh, ATP synthase is there, and so the concentration of proton will rise inside uh, in between this uh, this vesicle and less outside, so they can be transported outside, and ATP can be generated. Now these two scenarios, this first one and the fourth one, in almost similar. So this uh, this uh, first scenario cannot generate ATP but the say, this fourth one can generate because of the presence of this ATP synthase. Now if ATP synthase present in this first scenario then they can also produce ATP but as there is no ATP synthase so no, no such specialized protein which can drag these protons uh, from inside to outside mm, it is blocked so there will be no ATP but in this case that can be ATP because uh, ATP synthase is there so this is also right. Anyways. 
Now we have seen uh, the different experiments that will tell us that how the ATP, uh, this, this ATP production system or electron transport system actually works. And then uh, now we'll see the detailed mechanism of electron transport chain. Okay. Oxidative phosphorylation is the process by which electrons from the reduced cofactors NADH and ubiquinol are funneled in a stepwise manner to oxygen. Electrons flow much like electricity through a circuit, with free energy being conserved through the concomitant formation of a proton gradient. In the end, the investment of reduced cofactors results in the production of ATP. Recall that the reduced electron carriers NADH and ubiquinol are produced during glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, as well as fatty acid oxidation pathways. During the cellular process of respiration, oxidative phosphorylation utilizes the chemical energy of these reduced molecules to produce a TP. In nearly all eukaryotes, the ultimate electron acceptor in a series of oxidation reduction reactions is oxygen within the mitochondrion. The anatomy of a mitochondrion reflects its role in the process of oxidative phosphorylation. Click on the parts of the organelle to learn about its features. The inner membrane is impermeable to most substances, including ions, and encloses a space referred to as the matrix. The inner membrane is convoluted in structure, thereby providing a large surface area for the protein complexes of the oxidative phosphorylation chain. The mitochondrion consists of two membranes that are separated by the intermembrane space. During oxidative phosphorylation, protons are pumped into this compartment. The outer membrane is porous and allows for the free diffusion of small molecules due to the presence of channel proteins called porins. The topology of the outer membrane resembles that of a bacterial outer membrane in accordance with the mitochondrion's origin as a bacterial symbiont. Since the inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to most molecules, NADH produced from glycolysis in the cytosol must be imported via the biochemical reactions of the malate aspartate shuttle. The process is a form of currency exchange between one region of the cell and another. ATP, ADP, and phosphate also require transport proteins for their import and export across the inner membrane. Okay, now uh, in this part I must tell you about this mallet aspartate shuttle in a little bit amount that uh, n normally what happens, this is the oxaloacetate which is generated uh, via the citric acid cycle, but oxaloacetate uh, cannot uh, transport it or cannot be transported outside the uh, outside the inner membrane of mitochondria, so, so there is no transporter uh, in, in the mitochondrial cell which can transport oxaloacetate. For that purpose we need to convert the oxaloacetate into something else that can be transported and in this case it is transported, uh, it is converted into aspartate now aspartate can easily be transported uh, across the mitochondrial membrane now as aspartate is transported outside the mitochondrial membrane now this aspartate is, is further converted again into oxaloacetate now oxaloacetate along with NADH uh, will convert it itself into malate now malate or malic acid can easily enter through this uh, mitochondrial membrane and can enter into the matrix of mitochondria and then this mallet can give rise to NADH and then we all know that mallet is also a uh, ingredient or also intermediate of citric acid cycle so this is a shuttle between mallet and aspartate uh, for carrying this oxaloacetate containing uh, uh, oxaloacetate uh, carrier problem or for for uh, for for uh, solving the problem of ox oxaloacetate carrying uh, in the mitochondria okay so this is uh, called this uh, oxaloacetate uh, this is called the mallet aspartate shuttle sorry the inner membrane contains many proteins including the three major electron transporting complexes electrons from NADH and ubiquinol are shuttled between the complexes in a stepwise manner that relates to their reduction potentials 
Prosthetic groups within each complex contain metal ions that facilitate electron transfer. Some groups within the protein complexes can directly accept two electrons at a time, while others can only accept one. The reduction state of these one electron carriers must be restored before a second electron can be transferred. Electrons from reduced NAD begin their journey at complex 1. Complex 1 transfers a pair of electrons from NADH to ubiquinone, with several redox centers acting as intermediate acceptors. First, two electrons are donated to a flavin mononucleotide group. From here, the electrons are shuttled one at a time through a series of iron-sulfur sites. Finally, ubiquinone accepts the two electrons in turn to become fully reduced. Ubiquinone is a mobile electron carrier that is freely diffusible within the lipid bilayer. For every pair of electrons transferred, complex 1 concurrently translocates four protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. A proton wire is formed as the protons are rapidly relayed through hydrogen-bonded amino acids within complex 1. In this manner, a proton differential, and therefore a pH gradient, begins to form across the inner membrane. The energy released from the dissipation of this proton gradient will eventually be used to form ATP. Two other things contribute electrons to the transport chain. The first is succinate dehydrogenase from the citric acid cycle, sometimes referred to as complex 2 in the transport chain. The second is the glycerol phosphate shuttle. These are not discussed in your textbook as part of the electron transport chain because they do not directly contribute to the proton gradient. Reduced ubiquinone next shuttles its electrons to the mobile carrier cytochrome C through the action of complex 3. Cytochromes are proteins containing a characteristic heme group. Members of the cytochrome family contain a characteristic heme group that consists of a porphyrin ring surrounding a central iron atom. The iron cycles between oxidized and reduced states as electrons are passed, some cytochromes are part of large protein complexes, but cytochrome C is a peripheral membrane protein that acts as a mobile electron carrier. Complex 3 extracts electrons from ubiquinone in a detailed two-step process known as the Q-cycle. One electron is passed to an iron-sulfur protein, to cytochrome C1, and then to cytochrome C. The second electron follows a different route, passing through cytochrome B and then back to a quinone to produce a semiquinone. Another ubiquinol donates its two electrons to complex 3. One electron passes through the iron-sulfur protein and cytochrome C1 to cytochrome C, and the other electron passes through cytochrome B to the waiting semiquinone. The net result is that two electrons are passed to cytochrome C and four protons are pumped into the intermembrane space to contribute to the proton gradient. The final step in the electron transport chain is the reduction of molecular oxygen by electrons derived from cytochrome C. Cytochrome C ferries its electrons to complex 4, which contains both heme prosthetic groups and copper ions. Ultimately, four electrons must be transferred through complex 4 to result in a full reduction of oxygen to water molecules. The net result is four more protons are pumped across the inner membrane per molecule of oxygen reduced, or two protons per electron pair. We have shown how electrons are ferried from NAD and ubiquinol to oxygen with the coupled formation of a proton gradient. But how is this gradient of free energy harvested to produce ATP? The protons that have accumulated in the intermembrane space are analogous to water that builds up behind a dam. These protons would spontaneously flow back into the matrix following their concentration gradient if the inner membrane were permeable to them. 
A complex channel protein known as ATP synthase allows the controlled flow of protons back into the matrix while at the same time harnessing the free energy of proton flow to convert ADP and phosphate into ATP. ATP can be thought of as a form of portable free energy or an energy currency that can be used for energy requiring reactions elsewhere in the cell. This is analogous to water flowing through the turbines of a dam to generate electricity. This process is known as kenyosmotic theory. The details of how ATP synthase functions at the molecular level will be explored in the next exercise on ATP synthase. Okay. Anyways, friends, uh, now we have seen the detailed mechanism of how electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to another electron carrier and then finally to the ATP synthase which generates the ATP for our purpose. Now you'll see how the ATP is generated and uh, what is the importance of that. Okay, so, so in this video we'll be talking about the different mediators of electron transport chain that means uh, we have seen that there there are different uh, complexes like complex 1 3 4 and then finally the ATP synthase we have also seen the complex uh, 2 which is a succinate dehydrogenase which is a part of uh, electron uh, which is a part of citric acid cycle and its role in this electron transport chain but now you'll see uh, the different mediators uh, some of them are positive mediators some of them are negative mediators but these mediators are important because these mediators can uh, can hamper uh, the production of ATP uh, during uh, this um, electron transport system now you'll see three different types of mediators one is the removal of oxygen then the second thing is the addition of cyanide compounds and the third thing is the uh, addition of uncoupling proteins and how these three different types of mediators are, uh, can hamper this uh, electron transport system and the production of ATP. Now let us move on. Let's look at the effects of certain factors on ATP yield. Anyways, uh, move on. Let's look at the effects of certain factors on ATP yield beginning with lack of oxygen. When the final electron acceptor is not available to an electron transport chain, the chain shuts down and is unable to continue to pump protons across the membrane. When the proton gradient is removed, ATP synthase can no longer produce ATP. Cyanide poisoning acts in a manner similar to oxygen deprivation. Cyanide blocks cytochrome A3, preventing that complex from reducing oxygen. With cytochrome A3 stuck in the reduced state, the other components of the chain are unable to change to the oxidized state. The proton gradient breaks down and ATP synthesis is halted. Some proteins use the proton gradient for some task other than producing ATP. These proteins are called uncoupling proteins because they uncouple or disconnect the electron transport chain from ATP synthesis. For example, thermogenin is a protein found in certain mammalian fat cells. Thermogenin uses much of the energy of the proton gradient to produce heat to keep the mammal warm, thus reducing the yield of ATP. Okay, so we have seen the different types of uh, negative regulators of electron transport system and how they can affect this electron transport system. Now let's move on to this final slide of how uh, the ATP is synthesized and you can find a several video on this ATP synthesis machinery in my channel too and this is the combination of all different animations. So let us move on to here. Hello friends, uh, in this video we will be talking about the production of ATP during the electron transport chain. Now after all the electrotransport chain uh, complexes we are having the final complex uh, and which is the most important uh, protein which is present there which is uh, the key enzyme for production of ATP is called the ATP synthase which is also embedded in the intermembrane of mitochondria uh, not intermembrane, inner membrane of mitochondria. Now the F0, F1 ATPase is uh, responsible for synthesizing ATP from a proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Now this gradient was established by the pumping of protons across these membranes during the transport of electrons from the electron carriers such as NADPH or NADH and FADH2. Now these molecules like NADH or FADH2 are a huge energy containing molecules because, because they are carrying many electrons. Now when they carry these electrons uh, 
I mean different steps like glycolysis and Krebs cycle they are generated now in this this is the situation of recycling back uh, this this uh, molecules to their earlier form like NADH has a uh, oxidized form NAD plus and FADH2 is having the FAD plus so we need to reshuffle back those NAD plus FAD, FAD plus uh, forms as well as we need to produce the energy which is present which is Im embedded in the NADH and FADH2 molecules now what we'll do we can see that this molecules can come and go through the several different complex systems and as they are moving from one complex to another complex they are donating electrons to that complex and as a result protons are being pumped onto the inter in membrane space inter in membrane space now what they are doing they are storing all those protons in the intermembrane space and uh, they are increasing the concentration of proton in the intermembrane space now right after all these processes when they have succeeded uh, succeedingly provide the high concentration of proton in the intermembrane space they utilizes the concentration gradient force uh, for uh, for production of ATP. Now we are having higher concentration at the intermembrane space and lower concentration of proton in inside the mitochondrial matrix. In those situations what they can do, they can drag this proton out from intermembrane space towards the matrix down the concentration gradient and we know any kind of reaction down the concentration gradient is always favored because they do not need extra energy and as they are storing the energy this down concentration gradient will help to build up uh, the ATP by attaching adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate okay now this is the machinery through which these protons can uh, can be entered into the matrix and if the protons enters just uh, through through this uh, intermembrane space via some small channels or channel proteins which has uh, which do not have any specificity of production of ATP that would be less effective so so in those cases cell designs this kind of enzyme which is called ATP synthase which is having a central pore and also made up with two units one is the F0 particle which is embedded in the inner membrane space another is the F1 rotary particle which is uh, rotating all the time sorry uh, for this part now F1 particle is not rotating uh, this is uh, a mistake of mine now F1 particle is uh, just staying uh, here uh, as it is now F0 particle is the rotary part and this red part is the tunnel through which uh, these uh, protons will enter into this matrix and F1 particle is made up with beta and alpha subunit and this is not rotary this is a stator part anyways and which is present uh, in, 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 in the central uh, in the matrix region of the mitochondria now uh, in between that this red color portion is a tunnel through which uh, this the, the no, there is another portion A and B. This is another linker region through which these protons can pass, and there is a ton. Sorry again, in this part two, this uh, this A and B is a linker region. It's only uh, link this uh, uh, these two parts F0 and F1 together. That doesn't mean that proton passes through this region. Proton always passes through this tunnel region, which is placed in in the middle, uh, which is denoted here with the red color. Now, uh, with all these things and uh, all these rotors and and stator, uh, it makes a motor-like structure. It's, it is just working like a turbine. Now, proton will be passed from one place to another as the protons are pumping in inside this mitochondria from uh, matrix from the intermembrane space ADP and ATP ADP and inorganic phosphates are combined to produce uh, ATP molecules now we'll now this diagram shows a side view as well as the top view of ATPS complex the top view is uh, from the inner membrane space okay so intermembrane space anyways the F0 part as you can see which is embedded in the membrane uh, inner membrane of mitochondria this domain consists of a number of identical subunits uh, which is labeled as C subunits and a section of gamma subunit uh, the translocation of this three proton causes the rotation of this C and gamma subunits together okay now uh, remember this very carefully so whenever a uh, proton translocates from this channel uh, so as a result this gamma subunit uh, and C subunit both subunits will rotate okay and the rotation uh, can only be caused when the three protons are pumped inside that's a very important part now let us uh, move into the F1 part the F1 uh, is, is a domain is a ring shaped a hexameric compound uh, of alternating alpha and beta subunits so one alpha one beta one alpha one beta like three alpha and three beta subunits are uh, are making the his this hexameric region the F1 domain is held in place by the alpha and beta subunits
subunits units together preventing its rotation during the ATP synthesis so it will block its rotation during ATP synthesis so in in, in a um, gist this F1 region is a uh, stator it is providing the room for the production of AD ATP and this uh, C part of the F0 part is made up with gamma and C region gamma and C subunit it is uh, acting as a rotor during the ATP synthesis now let us move on to the 3D conformational states. The interaction of the gamma subunit with the F1 alpha and beta subunit is asymmetric. Consequently, each beta subunit has a different conformation with distinct affinities and specificities. And this is uh, this affinity and specificity which denotes whether it binds with ADP, whether it binds with ADP plus inorganic phosphate or it binds with ATP. Okay, now the affinity changes uh, uh, depending upon the conformation of this beta shell subunit. One beta subunit has weak affinity for both ATP and ADP plus PI. One has strong affinity for ADP plus PI and the third has a strong affinity for ATP. So this is the varying subun uh, subunit affinity of beta which is uh, actually helping us to know the whether it is bound with ATP, it is bound with ADP or it is bound with ADP plus PI or not. In this illustration the arrow on the gamma subunit as you can see here the arrow on the gamma subunit allow uh, so the arrow on the subunit uh, points to the site with weak affinity so it is a weak affinity site or weaker affinity site as you can see in this picture weaker affinity for any ADP or PI this site is having a very very weaker affinity now if we look at uh, uh, it, in, in, in this illustration the arrow uh, you can know that the site clockwise to the one identified by this arrow uh, is having strong affinity towards the ADP plus PI as you can see in this uh, this direction so if we go the uh, clockwise direction let me take a color it will help you to understand uh, once a minute okay let me take this fine now uh, not blue take another color okay fine now here this is uh, this is the subunit this subunit is having uh, the lower affinity for ADP and PI in both the cases now if you go clockwise and you can find this subunit now this is the second subunit as we get looking at this is the first this is the second and this is the third one now the second subunit we are looking at is having uh, a low uh, uh, moderate affinity or having a um, good affinity towards ADP and PI but not a good affinity towards ATP but this is the third subunit which is having a most a strongest affinity towards ATP but not having the affinity towards ADP and PI okay so this is all about the affinity towards different state of ATP different state of adenosine diphosphate and phosphate interactions okay okay now let's move on now uh, the translocation of three protons through the F0 domain causes a 120 degree rotation of C as well as the gamma subunits. Since the alpha beta subunits are held in place they do not move. Okay, so they remain uh, remains uh, like a stator, right? ATP synthesis occurs when the conformational change in beta subunit causes the ATP to be more stable than ADP plus PI. When this change occurs, the bound ADP PI is converted to ATP. Now you can see here. Now this step previously uh, is having a less affinity state, but now it is having a moderate affinity towards ADP plus PI. Now right after that, when 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 it changes its conformation again, it is converted into a, a kind of conformation which favors uh, the strongest affinity towards ATP, and thus the ATP is produced. So this is the basic thing. So what is doing? It is continuously changing its conformation, and this is the conformation change which which is uh, which is denoting whether it binds with ATP or ADP or not. Now, if uh, suppose a state, uh, if look at this state is uh, is less affinity towards ATP or ADP, but now after the movement of this proton, it is having a moderate affinity towards ADP and PI, and then the second round of proton movement will cause the conformation change in such a way that it will have a higher affinity towards ATP and it will bind with ATP and ADP and PI will be converted into adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so this is the basic way of thinking about how it is produced. Now, if we can divide this ATP synthesis in four different parts, we will see what are the basic steps of production of this ATP. Now, in the very first step, we can find this empty complex. Okay, 
So you can find the empty complex and empty binding sites. The following steps focus on one of the three bindings of the F1 domain. Initially, this site has weak affinity for both ADP and ATP. Neither of these are bound to these sites for that, for that purpose. Okay. Now if you go on to the loading of ADP and PI, the rotation of the gamma subunit changes and conformation of the beta subunits. Creating a binding site for ADP and PI. Within the lower subunit, ADP and PI bind to this region. Okay, so ADP and PI will bind to this side because uh, due to the rotation of this gamma subunit, it changes the conformation of beta in such a way that now it is become uh, affinity. Uh, it is become affinic uh, towards this ADP and PI binding. Now then. Formation of ATP. Now, an additional proton of gamma subunit, uh, additional rotation of gamma subunit again changes the conformation of the lower beta subunit, creating a site that favors the binding of ATP. And as it was previously bound with ADP plus PY, now uh, it can bind with ATP or it can convert this ADP and PY interaction into ATP1 for the conformational change or for maintaining the tor torsional uh, strain, stress or for, 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 uh, for maintaining its conformation in the right orientation. Now in the third part it is releasing of ATP. The last rotation of gamma subunit uh, in this side uh, to return the low affinity state and releasing the newly formed ATP. So as a result of the further rotation of the gamma subunit it will further changes the conformation of beta subunit and then this beta subunit is having a very lower affinity towards ATP and thus it releases the ATP which is bound previously and that's how the ATP will be released. So these are the sequential steps of having a lower affinity towards ADP and PY, ADP and ATP. Then in the second step it is having slightly good affinity for binding with ADP and PI. And the third step it is having the uh, higher affinity to bind with ATP. And then the fourth step it is having a less uh, affinity towards ATP binding and ATP will be released. So these are the steps of production of ATP uh, with the help of this ATP synthase enzyme. But the main thing is that we must provide we must give enormous amount of protons in the intermembrane space before running this kind of ATP synthase enzyme because for for this ATP synthase enzyme to action properly it must have to have the supply of protons from the inner membrane space intermembrane space into the matrix of the mitochondria okay except for this proton movement this uh, enzyme will be sh will shut down Okay, we'll shut down his function. So this is really, really important and I hope it will help you to understand. Thank you. So we have seen uh, many different uh, type of animations and videos uh, which can clear your mind about the ATP synthesis and electron transport system. Now, in this case we can see this is a very, very difficult machinery to produce this ATP. But the actual goal is to maintain the energy currency inside the cell. So whatever metabolic processes we are carrying out, whether it is glycolysis or Krebs cycle, but that is not sufficient enough to produce uh, the concentration of ATP inside the cell. So we need to produce much more ATP. And this is the way of producing much more ATP. And electron transport system is exactly providing us the way to produce huge amount of ATP from those electron carrying molecules like NADH and FADH2 and we have seen all those machineries in detail and I hope this video will help you to understand how ETS is working and what are the basic part of it and I hope it will help you thank you